And we are live. Good evening, folks. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's edition of uh, Committee of the Whole Operations and Administration. I'm going to call the meeting to order, and I'm going to ask you to rise, if you can, as I read through the invocation. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities which are laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who served our community and who are no longer with us. So we continue to do the work we must in their memory. Please be seated. I believe the roll call has been taken, Chris. Through the chair, that is correct. Thank you very much. Uh, now, let me read out the rules and procedures uh, that we've adopted uh, for this, uh, this uh, COVID period. Um, we're operating virtually, of course. All members are gonna be muted for the meeting to keep feedback at a minimum. Web cameras for committee members shall be turned on to maintain the quorum. Staff will be requested to join the video meeting should the need to answer questions of members of the committee arise. Any members should indicate they wish to speak by pressing the raise hand button on the participant list screen. Kirk staff will lower the hand when you're all finished speaking. Uh, in the event that we get uh, kicked off for some reason, we may adjust uh, our timing and recess for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If after 15 minutes, we do not have quorum, the meeting adjourns. Uh, members of committee, are there any uh, declarations of conflicts of interest tonight? Uh, seeing none, we will forge on. Uh, let me tell you now about the items before us, which are currently uh, separated. Uh, we have uh, three delegations appearing to, tonight uh, on behalf of um, groups uh, speaking to item 6.1.10, the Cultural Hub Task Force. Uh, so that will be automatically separated. And let me ask uh, committee members now if you have any other items that you'd like separated. Councillor Vanderstel. Um, thank you, Chair Curie. Uh, 6.1.4, please. 6.1.4, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Vanderstel? Nothing, thank you. Beauty. Uh, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, 6.11, 6.13. Councillor, thank you. Last call, folks. Councillor Antoski, I'd like to ask you now to move the motion to approve all the items which were not separated. Uh, excuse me, 6.22, sorry. Got it, Councillor, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, that all items contained for consideration consent, which is 6.1 and 6.2, not separated for discussion purposes, be approved. And do we have a seconder? My seconder. Is still. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the vote now for um, those items which were not separated. Uh, Deputy Clerk, could you uh, process the vote, please? All items not separated for discussion purposes carries unanimously on a recorded vote of nine to zero. Members of the committee voting in favor as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, and Van Toborg. Thank you. And could you uh, tell the public what the uh, titles of the items are that we uh, chose not to deal with tonight? Through the chair, I could certainly do that. The items that were carried within the vote are as follows. Item 6.1.2, Emergency Operations Center lease with Branford Power Incorporated. Item 6.1.5, 34 Norman Street, Neighborhood Engagement Regarding On-Street Parking. Item 6.1.6, .6, Brandwood Park Road and Simpatico Crescent at Linden Hills Park, Traffic Control. Item 6.1.7, Nature's Grand Phase 2 Subdivision Agreement and Road Dedication Bylaw. Item 6.1.8, Road Dedication Bylaw, Gillespie Drive, Turnbull mm -hmm. Drive and Walmart Road. Item 6.1.9, War Memorials and Sento uh, Taft Working Group Report regarding Canyon Restoration. And Item 6.2.3, City of Brantford Water System Quality Management System 2020 Annual Update. Excellent, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, now, as I said, we're fortunate we have uh, three delegations tonight to come to speak to us. 
Uh, we're going to move on now to hear the first of our delegations, uh, Heidi Northwood, Cameron Maxwell from Wilfrid Laurier University, um, speaking to 6.1.10, the uh, Cultural Hub Task Force report. Uh, Heidi and Cameron, could you, uh, I'd like to say come on down, but uh, you don't really come on down virtually. Uh, come forward, I guess, to speak to us about 6.1.10. Uh, you have 10 minutes, folks, and that includes uh, any questions of committee members. Uh, so please proceed when you're ready. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present Laurier's proposal for Brantford's downtown cultural hub. Uh, Laurier is committed to supporting the city become a destination for creativity and the arts. The mid-sized performance space feasibility study found unanimous desire for more medium-sized arts and culture venues in Brantford, and we really feel downtown is an ideal location for such a venue, as it would add to an existing ecosystem of arts and culture centered around the Sanderson Center uh, and would support and drive demand for existing and new restaurants and retail businesses in the downtown. So what Laurier is proposing uh, is that the three, oh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, what Laurier is proposing uh, is that the, it, the existing movie theaters in one market be repurposed to create a 250 seat performance space with a stage measuring 40 feet wide by 30 feet deep. And this would be by transforming two of the existing theaters into this larger space. Uh, also a revitalized 100 seat art house movie theater, a flexible white cube gallery space for openings, events and additional space requirements and daily film showings and a standard rental rate for the performance space would generate the needed revenue to offer a discounted rental fee for a certain number of days per year in the 15 to 25 percent of bookable dates for local not-for-profit community uh, arts and music organizations. Uh, a number of potential collaborators have, been, collaborators have been identified, including the Princess Cinema, the Sanderson Center, and local arts uh, organizations. As a next step, the university will require a capital planning financial contribution from the city of Brantford to retain an architecture firm specializing in theater renovations to complete a planning and renovation assessment. The cost of this uh, contribution is $150,000. Next slide, please. So there were a few questions raised during our June 16th presentation that we can now provide uh, some more detail on. Uh, there were questions regarding rental pricing. Uh, Laurier's discounted rental rate of $500 for 15 to 25% of rentals over the first two years is designed to support local producers grow their productions. When we conducted an assessment of 10 similar size performance venues listed in the feasibility study, we found an average daily performance rental and production cost of $1,298, demonstrating that the $500 is far below uh, what many other uh, spaces are offering. The university also has uh, other spaces that could be rented for non-technical rehearsals. Regarding whether music performances were in plan for the space, they absolutely are. Uh, performances that are a good fit with the space in terms of stage and seating like soloists, duets, and small musical theater will definitely form a key component of potential programming. On renovation costs, once the a renovation plan is developed with itemized costs, Laurier would explore funding sources with the city of, of Brantford. And lastly, on what the timeline would be to bring this concept to life. Once the university receives funding uh, for the capital elements of the renovation, Laurier would estimate it could take two to three years to renovate the space and open it to the public. Uh, next slide, please. So since our meeting on the 16th, we've had a chance to engage with a range of arts organizations in the city to understand their needs. Uh, we want to uh, thank everyone we spoke to, and based on those conversations, we're, we're very confident that the proposed performance space would provide these groups with what, absolutely what they need to make their productions a huge success. So thanks for your time, uh, and now we'd be happy to answer any questions. Cameron, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Celeste, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, the one thing that I still have concerns with, and, and perhaps you can elaborate, you say you, you've had consultation with a number of the user groups. What, what's the cost uh, of rental? Uh, I believe it was $500 um, in your initial proposal, and it's still $500. Uh, 
but concerns were raised about the uh, that figure being cost prohibitive to many of the groups. Uh, was that addressed during your consultations? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that, Councillor Councilor Sless. Um, Five hundred dollars is um, the absolute minimum that, that we can go, given the cost uh, that it is to run it. Um, so what we are uh, hoping is that if it's possible, uh, that perhaps there are there are ways for those community groups either to use other locations that we have at Laureate for those non-technical rehearsals to reduce costs for them. But perhaps there's also some, some funding that's available to those groups. Uh, $500 is significantly lower than any other place in Ontario. In fact, uh, Cameron, you can, you can uh, confirm this. The closest that we found was somewhere around eight or $900 for reduced rate, a discounted rate for community groups. And that was, it was unclear what those what that cost included, whether it was all inclusive as ours is at 500 or whether there's, there was additional costs on top of it. Cameron, do you have anything more to add to that? No, I think um, that, that's exactly it. I think for one of the things we heard from the consultations is the, um, this sort of added costs in renting any of these types of locations where there's all of these additional kind of charges for staff and a, a cut from ticket sales and that sort of thing. And there seemed to be quite, um, you know, an understanding of this, this very transparent model that it would be a flat fee, very easy for these productions to plan around that and not kind of all of a sudden get this much larger bill than they're anticipating. Because when you look at how most venues are uh, presenting their pricing, it, it is quite complicated to actually figure out what the true cost is. Um, so we're trying to really out do away with that and be very transparent in the, in the cost and provide it at the absolute minimum we can. Okay, I, I think we're going to hear from a, at least a couple of these groups a little later on uh, after your presentation. Uh, but is, is it your uh, assertion that they're happy now with the $500 rental fee? My understanding is that $500 is still cost prohibitive for some of the groups. And that's why we would like to work with the organizations to be talking about other places that we have on campus uh, as, a, as an alternative. Um, and also um, thinking through um, with the city, perhaps, uh, possibities for, as I mentioned before, a subsidy, a subsidy perhaps from um, other organizations, perhaps the city. So um, 500 is, and we have, to, we have to make sure that we can keep the lights on, and uh, 500 is, is rock bottom from our perspective. So if there's other ways that they can, that, that these groups that we can, we can offer um, in partnership with the city or another organization, we'd, be, we'd love to do that either through that particular space that we're talking about or others on campus. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor, thank you. Councilor Wall, you have uh, the floor with 237 left. Great, I'll try to be super quick. Um, thank you guys for your presentation. Thanks so much for uh, all your kind words about downtown Brantford and for wanting to do this for our community. First question, uh, in all the numbers and all the stuff that you have run, if X theater company wants to run a show in your theater and it's $500 for the rental, have you run numbers on what capacity they would need to have for a show to be successful with their operating costs, et cetera? Cameron, I'll hand that one over to you. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, done that. We can share that. Um, uh, it's tough to answer that uh, in this forum. No, but you but, have, yeah, we have done that. Absolutely done that. Um, awesome. That's what I wanted to know. If you can send it over, I'd love to see it. The sure. second thing was, this is a huge undertaking and a significant amount of time. And I'm a huge proponent of the, if you'll build it, they will come. But additional to providing the space, what is Laurier uh, or partners planning on doing to entice people to come? Um, would there be more than just providing the space? Will they be working with the uh, people who are renting the space to promote the shows? And is there anything that you guys are gonna be doing that's maybe intrinsic to helping these shows be successful? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, I think uh, working with the local groups to help with uh, marketing, uh, having a good coordinate, coordinated effort with the Sanderson uh, Center, I think is also going to be key. Uh, I'm also hearing of some very interesting things that are happening in the community to support community, uh, community theater and music in helping to promote their activities in, in a coordinated way. I think these are all things that we are here to help support those groups do that. Um, so is that, we're also um, 
Is, is that your, because I think your question could, I could understand that in one of two ways, Councillor Well, One of them is from the audience perspective and one of them is from our perspective in getting all of the, the, uh, the different um, uh, organizations to be taking part. I'm sorry, because I, I want to not use up all my time, but I mean, I think the question is very specific that if you're going to take this monumental undertaking and commit to this, you're going to want it to be successful. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, how are you going to ensure that it is? Uh, beyond, you know, the shows promoting themselves and them selling tickets. Yes. What's your backup plan? We have devoted staff that will be looking to program the theater, at not just the discounted rate, but the whole year. Uh, and our partnership, uh, obviously, with uh, the dance community uh, is, is key to that, as is our partnership, uh, hopefully, will become more, more um, uh, closer with the Sanderson. So this is going to work, no matter what. Well, we have to find money to renovate it. <laughs> That's but yes, time, folks. Like Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Cameron, for coming. Uh, we're going to move on now to the second delegation, which is uh, Martin Smith at Ichthyus Theater Productions. Are you there, Martin? Hello, Martin. Chris, do we have Martin? There he is. Welcome. You'll have to unmute yourself, Martin. Good evening. Good evening. You have 10 minutes, sir, including uh, questions from members of the committee. Go ahead when you're ready, please. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as some of you may know, I'm on a few theater boards, uh, the Symphony Board, and I'm the chair of the BCAC as well. Uh, but tonight I'm specifically reflecting on the challenges and hopes of ICFIS Theater Productions. Um, I'm the president of that board. ICFIS was created in 2000 and is celebrating 21 years, although admittedly for the past year, um, we've only been doing online shows and nothing in person. Um, for 20 years, um, ICFIS has bounced around from location to location, renting buildings that were created for other purposes, um, adapting the best we can. Uh, we've moved props, staging, and costumes from one storage area to another. We've built sets and locations around town. We've tried to encourage audiences to find us in a new location. So a little bit of a game of Where's Waldo? Um, we've been nomadic for basically two decades. During those uh, 20 years, the City Productions has always been an ad advocate, pardon me, for a mid-sized performance hall or cultural hub. Um, I wanna tell you very quickly why we're still advocates for that. Um, I've had a, a chance, um, mostly before uh, COVID, but a little bit um, during the, the breaks in COVID, to kind of tour around uh, other areas. Uh, and I've seen mid-sized performance halls in Port Dover, Simcoe, Midland, Woodstock, Cambridge, Burlington, Alora, Elmira, Dundas, um, Penetanguishin, uh, Sarnia, Dunville, Binbrook, Hanover, Kincardine, Owen Sound, St. Mary's, the town, not the church, uh, Tilsonburg, and Woodstock. I've had a chance to participate in productions in some of these centers. A couple of those centers are bigger than us, but most of them are much smaller. So I think we have a void in this city, the, uh, one that makes it um, a real challenge for community groups to perform. And that void is an affordable performance hall that is suited to the needs of theater, uh, dance or music, um, all performing arts. This lack of space has forced community groups to spend human resources to try to find affordable space rather than focus solely or mostly on creating the art. Um, thank goodness for dedicated volunteers, uh, those who are passionate about uh, their discipline. Uh, a typical production involves, as you might know, a team of actors, a director, one or more technicians, backstage crew, board of directors, fundraisers, someone to apply for grants, costume makers, ticket takers, refreshment sellers, producers, stage manager, ushers, and a plethora of other volunteers. Nicholas Theater Production, like all the theater groups in this city and surrounding area, Stage 88, Paris Performers, Grand Theater Workshop, Grand View Theater Company, and many more, have very similar stories. Teams of volunteers trying to put on a show in a less than ideal circumstance and a less than ideal facility. The proposal put forward by Laurier comes with a lot of questions for community groups, but you know, rather than get caught up in the weeds of asking what kind of light bulbs we're gonna use, um, I did wanna point out two main concerns for if this theater. Um, the first is of course affordability, which we've touched a bit on tonight. The current document tells us about $500 a night for a rental. Um, and although we have a very active theater community with lots of talent and enthusiasm, um, I don't believe we're at a point where that's going to be an easy rental fee to make the math work. Um, if we um, 
uh, if we're only going to use the cultural hub for performances and not for rehearsal or dress rehearsal space, it's still going to be tight math um, because there's also the cost of royalties, the costs of sets, costumes. Um, most of the theater companies are have no professional members, no actors, uh, producers, directors getting paid. Um, there's just some hard costs that we cannot avoid when we're putting on a show. Theater companies in Brantford have faced the challenge for not having a proper venue, um, which has been a, a part of the reason that tickets prices are probably lower than they should be and audiences have been lower than they should be. Um, I'm very confident that $500 a night can be obtained eventually, but out of the gate, that will be a challenge. The other concern for <clears throat> like this theater company is accessibility. Uh, Brantford is blessed with a lot of producers of art um, and a clear plan on how rentals will be handled will be required. We know in the early stages, that's probably a tough question to ask of the Laurier team. Um, it would appear that 51 to 94 days is the, <clears throat> is the goal for a year, but not all days in the 365 day year are equal. So there's some questions behind the accessibility and who will have the, uh, the Laurier facility at, at what time of year. Um, I still think this proposal holds great promise and that's why we're supporting it. Um, it helps community groups answer the question of where you are located, because um, that's a moving target for most companies. Um, it gives our city a much needed second option for theater, music, dance, and more. Um, we have a wonderful facility with the Sanderson Center. Had the pleasure of working there a number of times, but it is not affordable to community groups at all. Um, you cannot access it. Um, it's, it's obvious that the arts are popular, but if we're going to support local actors, playwrights, singers, dancers, painters, we require a showcase building um, where that can happen. And um, just quickly, um, here are uh, what I think are some of the multi-layered upsides to having a cultural hub or mid-sized performance hall. There are financial benefits to creating a space for vibrant arts to, to flourish with spin-off business um, and that the income that these theater companies can have to continue to thrive. There are incredible social benefits in the arts, an opportunity for artists um, to be artists and to be involved. There are health benefits for both the artists and those taking part in the arts. So if this theater production supports moving ahead with the Laurier proposal, hoping that this facility will offer a solution to a multi-decade concern for Brantford and putting arts at the forefront of why this is such a great city. Martin, thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Antoski, you have uh, three minutes and 37 seconds. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. And, and thank you. Um, you kind of covered the whole gamut and, and, and made your position clear on it as well, because it, it might have been questionable. So clearly, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of questions. Um, it, you, you touched on it a little bit in terms of, you know, if we have a place where we can all kind of play in the same sandbox, you believe that the capacity can be built um, to be able to afford the the fifty dollars a day, or, uh, so is that? Would some sort of a transitionary um, plan of some sort help? So maybe there's some sort of a tiered thing to get get groups there, and and like we say, no solution is going to be great for everyone. But how does this help the groups build capacity? Um, it, it helps build capacity because it's a venue that people can count on. They know where it is. They're not scratching their head trying to figure out where a group is performing this week. Um, because last time I went to a show, it was somewhere else. So that, that's an obstacle all the time. So this becomes a consistent place where they can go to. Um, and then I do believe the, the base will build over time because of that. Um, there's a consistency in that. There's a quality in that as well. Um, I've performed a number of times in community halls and I'm glad we have community halls, but they are less than ideal for putting on a play. Um, you do not have the lights and the, and the uh, microphone and all the things that you really would like to have for a show. So I think that what you're, pro you're proposing, um, where maybe there's a transition period to get to there, I wouldn't want to deny Laurier that $500 is the bare, bare minimum and in fact is a concession, a much appreciated concession. Um, but looking at my calculator, um, it, it doesn't seem that money could be made for any show to begin with out of the gate. We need, we need the bodies to start showing up first. 
a and they chicken, and they will. <laughs> a chicken and egg conundrum. Yeah. Okay, th thank you, and thank you, Martin, for uh, you know supporting the community, the arts and, and culture community, and being a big such a big part of it in the city. Councillor, thank you, and Councillor Wall, go ahead, please. You have about a minute. Thanks, Martin, for being here. Two questions, I'll be super quick. So the first is you seem to have a wealth of experience and knowledge with theaters and other communities. Um, do you have any insight to provide to this council or anybody watching or listening on how they're pulling it off and why we're struggling so much? And the second is it sounds like what's needed at least until we can get this off the ground is some sort of subsidy. And I don't necessarily know that that's taxpayer dollars, but definitely subsidizing it somehow. And I'm wondering if you had any insight on that, whether it's uh, government grants or sponsorships or Laurier or taxpayer dollars. I can speak to a couple of facilities that I know, one in Cambridge, one in Simcoe, um, <clears throat> that because the history has been there, they are making money now, they are doing well. Um, matter of fact, Simcoe is now going to team with Port Dover. Um, so there's a longer history there. Um, and there was help to begin with to get the ball rolling. Martin, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm going to ask uh, that we move on now to the third and final delegation before us tonight. Uh, Pat Lenz, uh, I hope you're there. Are you there, Pat? Hello, Pat. Chris, do we have Pat? Yeah, she's just being put in the meeting right now. There she is. Welcome, Pat. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. And that includes any time that's left for councillors to ask questions. So please uh, go ahead. I understand. Good evening, Councillor McCreary and colleagues. Um, as, as you said, my name is Pat Lenz and I'm a citizen of Ward 2 in the city of Brantford. But this evening I speak to you in, as a member of the board of directors of stage 88. In that capacity, I'm speaking in favor of the recommendation that city council accept the cultural hub proposal submitted to the Cultural Hub Task Force by Laurier Brantford. So who you ask or what is Stage 88? We are a not-for-profit Brantford-based community theater company born a couple of decades ago in the rehearsal hall of the Sanderson Center at 88 Dalhousie. Since 2006, Stage 88 has mounted at least one production each year. From 2006 until 2012, these shows were all performed at the Sanderson Center, initially in the rehearsal hall and eventually on the main stage. In 2013, a board of directors was formed for the company with the goal of expanding both the number and the variety of Stage 88 productions. Since that time, Stage 88 has performed at the Brantford Arts Block, Paris Fairground, the Stephen and Helen Kuhn Theater at Laurier Brantford, the Gord Painter Theater at North Park and the Polish Alliance Hall, while continuing regular productions at the Sanderson Center. Although we hope and expect to continue our strong relationship with the Sanderson Center, we continue to live the life of nomads when performing our smaller productions away from the Sanderson Center. The ongoing repetitive search for space for auditions, for rehearsals, for set building and for storage, as well as for performances, is a constant drain on the energies of our volunteers. Yet this nomadic existence is the norm for arts groups seeking to perform in this city. Rather than focusing on the creative elements and on the marketing of our productions, we spend countless hours every time looking for an affordable place to rehearse and to perform. A cultural hub would provide a focal point for all kinds of smaller productions in the city for theater, music, comedy, poetry, and so on. This would lead to the community watching that facility for a variety of local arts experiences, resulting, as Mar Martin explained, in joint marketing and cross-promotion opportunities. Arts organizations could then devote more resources to marketing to expand our audiences, and that's where we generate more revenue. This in turn would allow these organizations over time to pay higher usage fees, fees that are closer to market rate. Please remember that we pay fees for every day we use a space for setup, for rehearsals and for performances. So even though we only generate revenue during the days of our actual performances, hence our sensitivity to the cost of renting a space. 
Stage 88 support for the Laurier proposal in particular comes from our long-term relationship with Laurier Brantford as it has developed this proposal. In 2015, we presented a production at the Stephen and Helen Kuhn Theater at Laurier Brantford. We offered the technical expertise of Stage 88 to familiarize Laurier staff and students with use of the, at that time, new professional lighting system in the space. And in recognition of that partnership, we were given a substantial discount on the rental fee for the space, rendering it affordable. Through that experience, we did gain several valuable insights about the space as a theater, which we did share with the Laurier staff. Then in 2018, we were invited to tour Laurier spaces to explore with them possibilities for Stage 88 and other local arts groups. We visited the space connected to the Brantford Convention Center and the Market Square Cinema Spaces. Now again, in 2021, we're exploring the use of the Stephen and Helen Kuhn Theatre for a winter 2022 show. We believe that the Laurier Cultural Hub proposal reflects the insights gained from our work to date with Laurier. Its central downtown location is definitely an asset. The proposed performance space is a suitable size. The plan for its layout and its equipment reflects the needs of community theater groups. And the Laurier infrastructure will provide support for the activities of the users. But the caveat, in order to ensure the space is accessible to not-for-profit arts groups, the rent has to be affordable. Time and support will be required to enable arts groups to improve their marketing efforts to attract a larger audience. Thank you. Councillors, for your attention to our recommendation, which is to accept the Laurier proposal for a long awaited cultural hub in our city. Thank you very much, Pat, for your presentation. Thank you for coming tonight. Councillor Celeste, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chor, Mr. Chair, and thanks for coming, Pat. Thanks, John. The, um, the common theme here is affordability. Um, and Laurier is proposing $500 a show, or $500 rather, a day. Uh, what is affordable to, to your group? Our board members told us you were gonna ask that question. <laughs> At this point, what's affordable for our group for a week is more like 12 to $1,500 for a week. Remembering we have to be in there for two to three days, depending on the show, to set up our set, to set up the technical stuff, to do a technical rehearsal, to do a dress rehearsal before we start bringing in any money. Okay, and what is your definition of a week? Is, is that a Monday to Friday or is that a seven day week? Uh, no, probably six days. Six days? Six days, Monday to, so normally we would have three to four performance nights preceded by two to three setup nights. I'm not a mathematician, but I would say that's working up to roughly $200 a day. If we're counting all of the days, yep, okay. absolutely. So I guess in order for, for groups like yours, and I believe yours is very typical financially, uh, we're looking to find about a $300 per day subsidy. At the beginning. Yes. And one of the, the term capacity has been used. I'm familiar with the process when St. Catharines was developing their performing arts center. They were, they consulted their user groups and actually ran capacity building workshops with their user groups to help the user groups identify growth areas, whether it was grant proposals or community sponsorships or marketing, but anything that could make help the groups reach the level that the facility was going to need to charge. So I would suggest that would be worthwhile exploring is the success of their capacity building exercises for the local groups and the center itself. Great, thanks for your, uh, your answers and thanks for coming, Pat. Thanks, John. Councilor, thank you. Uh, Councilor Antosky, go ahead, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair McCurry. Uh, thanks for coming, Pat. Um, we heard uh, Heidi talk about the possibility of using different facilities for different portions of, uh, you know, so you do your, your, your actual show with the audience for the $500 a day and work on a plan for, you know, maybe set or rehearsals. Is, is that doable or does that take you back to the same kind of problem that you're experiencing now? It's rare to find a 
location in which we could leave our thing. We're volunteers. We have day jobs. Well, except those of us who are retired. <laughs> and so we rehearse in the evenings. We can't be there all day as a professional troupe would be to do rehearsals and set building at that point usually. So we need that kind of time, which means tying up the space for a longer period. We, for instance, um, as I mentioned, we're exploring use of the Stephen and Helen Kuhn Theater for the second time. Um, but it has to be done at a time when it's not interfering with student use. So we're looking at uh, reading week in February. That's obviously, there aren't too many of those kinds of times available in the school year. Um, also, I really appreciated um, the Laurier presentation mentioning an all-inclusive rate, because to be honest, we did run into that when we used Laurier the first time is, um, I'm sure it was an innocent mistake, but the cost that we had to pay for security personnel to be on site when we were on site outside of Laurier actual working hours doubled the fee that we had expected to pay. So, so the flat rate is helpful in terms of planning Definitely. and all of those things. Okay, thank, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Pat, thank you very much for coming this evening and thank you to the other delegations uh, that appeared. We're gonna be advancing this item uh, for your interest uh, immediately once we get it on the floor. Uh, Councilor Rutley, could I ask you to, uh, to uh, move the resolution to um, put all the separated items on the floor and I believe they would be this one, 6.110, 6.14, 6.11, 6.13, and 6.22. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be happy to do that. Um, what I have in front of me is um, slightly different to what you just announced. So could staff pull it up uh, on the screen, please? Thank you. Oh, that is what I've got in front of me. Okay. Uh, that all items for con oh, moved by myself, seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Sless, that all items for consideration, consent, uh, 6.1 and 6.2 separated for discussion purposes be approved. Councillor, thank you. So we're going to proceed with uh, 6.110 currently, which is the one to which we had three delegations. Uh, do we have a speaker's list, folks? Councillor Antosky, you have the floor. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Count, uh, Chair McCurry. Uh, clearly, there's still a lot of work to be done here. Um, and, and there certainly have been further discussions since this was first, first talked about at the task force. Um, and it may, you know, it may be that this is not the, the end result. This may be a really needed stepping stone uh, for these groups. And I think we've heard tonight that it's not perfect, but it's the right step forward. And they're willing to work uh, towards, you know, need to, being where they need to be. Uh, and it's not, we haven't talked about this tonight, but it's not just the, the performance theater, you, um, the mid-sized theater, you will remember that they talked about a white space or the white box space, which can uh, accommodate other types of art. So, so I think, there's a few different pieces here that we haven't talked about much um, here that covers some of the other arts and cultural pieces that we've been looking to, to uh, pull together for both communities, for the pr pr production community and, and for those who want to go and visit these um, and, and partake and spend their money at these types of events. Uh, as we've worked on this, one of the things that became very apparent was not only the lack of, of infrastructure, the lack of a building, um, it really was um, community development within the cultural world. And, and that is largely because they've had to ha they've had to be friendly competitors trying to find space everywhere and and um and so they've never been able to do you heard them talking about the benefit of joint marketing and and cross promotion that is huge and this is this is solving all part of that chicken and egg uh scenario that this group these groups have been stuck in so it, it's not perfect, um, but it certainly is a step forward. I think it's a great stepping stone for our art and um, culture community. And, um, you know, maybe maybe there's two, three more steps down the road, but this is, this is something that we've got to partner with and um, something that we're hearing that the groups support um, with, with more work to do. So, so I'm hoping that um, committee will, We'll pass this. Thank you. 
Councillor, thank you. Councillor Sless, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I had concerns of whether I could support this or not uh, before this evening, to be quite candid. And after hearing both sides of the story, the uh, the proponent and, and the and the end user, it uh, it would appear to me that there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, I think there's been give and take on both sides. And I think as Councillor Antosky said, um, is it perfect? No, but is it closer to where we should be to, than we are without doing it? Uh, it's way closer. And, and I think um, as has been said, it, it's a good start. And, and I think really, um, it's hard to believe, but I think it comes down to money. Uh, that never happens in our business, but it, it appears that uh, money seems to be the answer here. And, and it seems to be uh, a way of helping these folks get, uh, kind of get off the ground and, and get them started um, on, on the way to being uh, self-sustaining uh, financially. So I, I'm pleased to support it. Uh, and I commend both the users and, and Laurier for, uh, for being flexible enough to allow this process to move forward. And uh, I, I would hope council supports this. It, um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, and really, I think what we've got here is, is probably the start of a process. So I'm happy to see this and I'm happy to support it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilor, thank you very much. Councilor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to staff, is there anyone who can answer a couple of questions about the Sanderson Center? What is the rate for per day for the main theater and for the rehearsal hall? Just for comparison. And I don't see anybody jumping in to, oh, here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Kevin Finney, Director of Economic Development Tourism. Unfortunately, I don't have that information with me, Councillor, but I can definitely get back to you on that. Yeah, if we could have that information for Council Night, that would be appreciated. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Utley, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm also very supportive of uh, this project. Um, and I, I'd like to thank Heidi Northwood for giving me a tour of the, um, the, the theatre area. Uh, it really was an eye opener for me. And I, I'd forgot all these years later that there used to be a movie theatre there. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's carpet, um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's three segments to it, which uh, make it very flexible. Uh, so that, that was a big check off on the capital cost list as far as I was concerned. And because, uh, you know, I think the, um, you know, the original idea may have been to um, design a brand new, uh, theatre and then raise money for it uh, to make it work. Well, we we don't have to do so much of that this this time around. It also supports our downtown in many many ways, um, and I believe that you know once this gets off the ground, and I I'm sure it will, uh, that you know it will bring more people to to uh, the downtown area like uh, bees to a honeypot. And then the last thing is. Um, yes, it's going to be a cost, but I'm sure that there are a number of uh, sponsors and supporters in the community that would provide some seed money or sponsor on a short-term, long-term basis uh, some, some funds towards uh, our cultural hub. So I'll leave it at that, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Councillor Edley. Councillor Wall, go ahead, please. Thanks, Councillor McCurry, and you're doing a great job as chair, I might add. Um, Kevin, Mr. Finney, are you our guy? You're the one talking right now about the city's perspective on this? Yeah, I also have Sarah Monroe on, on with us too, so Sarah I figured, in sight. I figured Sarah was gonna be here too. Okay, so I had a question just come in kind of on the periphery and it was, is this a Laurier thing or is this a city of Brantford thing? And what is gonna be that kind of line in the sand that like, I was just going through the report again and at the very top it says that in 2015, we started talking about this. And you know, here we are six years later still talking about this and the city's committed. Economic development is committed. The members of this community are committed to making arts be alive, a living, breathing thing in our, here in our community. And I know that our city supports it, but the last thing I would want is to come across is that, you know, Laurier did all this and the city didn't. So what would be, 
how are we going to imply or you know definitely make note that this is a collaborative thing? And what exactly is the city's role? And any comments you can provide for anybody who's not gonna read this report. Through the chair, it's Sarah Monroe, Manager of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Councillor Wall, that is a very good question because we still need to iron out the details. Uh, this task force was formed in 2015. And one of the first decisions that this task force made was that the city would not be in a very good position to operate another performing arts space or a mid-sized performance space. It would also make the space cost prohibitive for the groups as the Sanderson Center is staffed by unionized staff. That is one of the, the things that makes their fees quite a bit higher. So we needed to find another third party operator when we had the feasibility study for a mid-sized performance space done by Novita Interpairs, they also agreed that it was in the city's best interest to have that third party operator as the lead and the city to support that lead along the way. So in the future, we will definitely iron out those details. Um, we'll likely be coming forward with that financial ask to get the planning process underway for Laurier if this is approved, and then we'll look at ad additional ways that we can be involved. So we, we talked about things like collaborating when it came time to ticketing. Is that something that the Sanderson Center back box office could help with to reduce the costs that Laurier would have to incur and then pass on to those organizations? So there are a lot of different ways that we could collaborate. We would definitely need a, a memorandum of understanding as we work through this process, but we're we know that we're committed to partnering with them in, in some way and making sure that this is successful if it is supported by council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Councillor Vanderstil, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Chair McCurry. Um, yeah, no, I, I was, I was as a professional artist without a conflict of interest in this case, I was lucky, I think, to have a space at the Arts Block downtown that was subsidized. I was fortunate enough to be on the Brandt Studio Tour a number of times in the Home Leah Art Crawl. That was subsidized. We subsidized that ourselves through spaces that we own, backyards that we own, garages and 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 areas that we own. It's it you know that's part of the art studio. I mean, you have to find a subsidy. Um, I, I, I moved the gallery from its, its uh, location to the number one market square. I was very fortunate enough to have my, uh, my, some of my pieces in, the, in the, uh, the library space that was held there at that time. So, uh, I, you know, I, I realized that it's a, uh, it's a work in progress, predating 2015. We've been talking about our underfunded position as a municipality uh, in my first term of council as well. This is a significant improvement, but again, it comes with a question of subsidy. Um, if, if there's room for sponsorships, if there's room for additional support from the municipality, I hope we're working towards that effect because in a sense, um, arts and culture in Brantford has been an orphan for far too long. It, it needs to be adopted into our public spaces. It needs to be accentuated. It needs to be brought into areas where uh, it can be seen, not in the basements of everybody's homes. We need to see dance. We need to see so much more music in a, on a public stage. We need to see theater in a public stage. This is one significant step in the right direction but it's, our work isn't finished yet. As speaking as a professional artist, I know that we have more steps that we can take, not only with our uh, help assistance funding and capacity building with these groups, but also with the, with the public as well. Uh, also working through this misnomer that there are spaces in our city that are, are inaccessible for a number of different reasons. I think we need to change the culture around that. And when we talk about bringing people to a centralized location where arts and culture is celebrated, I, I think we need to focus on bringing more people there. I think more people in a cultural hub, I think more people in the core, I think more people enjoying what we offer and what everybody in the area offers in terms of art is something that we need to celebrate and we needed to celebrate that for quite some time now. So I, I look forward to how this unfolds and uh, and and how the uh, how the brush hits the canvas on this, 
And I, I hope to be here long uh, into the process of how that works out. So I'll be supporting this and uh, I'm, I'm hoping for a unanimous support tonight. Thank you. Councillor, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Acting Mayor McCurry. Uh, just a question to, to uh, staff, whoever is uh, responsible for this. Uh, item B says that the Culture Hub Task Force uh, recommends the Wilfrid Laurie proposal for adoption by council as the Culture Hub in Brantford and that be directed to provide a report to the Committee of the Whole on the execution steps. Can you tell me what you expect execution steps to look like? Through the chair to Councillor Carpenter, that report we're hoping to have in by the end of this year, where we're, we will address some of these concerns, as well as that funding ask from Laurier that they alluded to within their delegation. So in that, we'll look for alternative options, hearing that we can definitely hear from user groups that that fee structure may be a little bit too high from them. Um, so we will propose some alternate options for how we can we can help them along the way and make sure we're addressing those capacity issues that they need assistance with. No, thanks, Sarah. And, and Sarah, the, the report also talks about the $150,000 up front for, uh, for funding for an architecture well, review of what's needed uh, in, in the facility. Uh, where would those funds be coming from? Sarah, I'm not sure if it's uh, through you, uh, uh, Chair McCreary, it's uh, Brian Hutching, CEO. At this point in time, uh, Councillor, we have not determined that that report in December, as Sarah's promised, will we'll come forth with how those how we'll fund this. We don't, we, right now, we're trying to get over this first hurdle that, that Laurier be the culture hub. We're gonna bring back the second uh, report with, with more details and more information on, on how we, the funding and well as subsidy and those sorts of things would come back in December, Council. So does that, uh, so this report just gets us to move, move forward with uh, Wilfrid Lori as the possible hub. Uh, th this won't address the five or ten million dollars needed to, to uh, rebuild these facilities to make them uh, workable? I'm not sure, Sarah, you're going to answer, I can't see you, but you, uh, this will this will take, this This is exactly what you said, Councillor, it takes, it, it designates Wilfrid Lori. Now we get in discussions with them about what it's gonna take this $150,000 architectural fee, how we're gonna pay for that. And also what sort of capital, is that Laurier's capital or, is, or the city's capital and all the details regarding operations and shared services or possible subsidies. So that's the next step council. We'd be too premature to have those done before this. We'd be moving ahead of council if we were to do that. So that's the next step. So the next two or three months that Sarah and team will be working on. Okay, and that includes, that includes a memorandum of understanding I would take it. Yes, uh, that would be the next uh, step, uh, next step in the legal process uh, down that road, yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Acting Mayor McCurry. Uh, thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, I don't see another hand up, so I'm gonna take this opportunity to say a few words myself. Um, I, I, I tend to concur, it's, it's high time that we did for the arts and culture community in Brantford, what we've done for minor sport and um, uh, competitive sport here with respect to uh, our construction of Gretzky Center and a number of artificial uh, three season turf fields uh, here in the city of Bradford and um, our arts and culture folks have, uh, have uh, taken uh, a back seat to a lot of our expenditures. And, and I think it's high time that that changes. And I do believe what's in front of us today is a, is a pretty good first step. Uh, I'm hopeful this may come to fruition, but um, I um, like most counselors, I'm not quite willing to write a blank check at this point in time. So I'm pleased to see that staff will be acting in terms of taking some further steps to see if this truly is financially viable. We do support uh, the arts community, uh, theater, voice, um, performance uh, by providing them with operating grants, performance grants um, that are that come from a number of sources. Um, this, you know, going forward, this may see a revision in terms of how we fund those groups. Uh, they may no longer receive direct funding, but rather the funding may well go to subsidizing performance and uh, gallery space uh, here at the, what could be the new cultural hub uh, so I, I, I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to support this today. Uh, as I said, I'm not, I'm not uh, happy about writing a blank check at a future date. So uh, as a friend of mine likes to say, the devil will be in the details uh, that we see before the end of the year. And I'm very hopeful that those details will allow us to bring this to fruition. Last call guys for a speaking opportunity on this item, seeing none, we'll go to the clerk for the vote.
item 6.1.10 culture hub task force report regarding culture hub proposals carries unanimously recorded vote of nine to zero members of the committee voting in favor are as follows councillors vanderstelt slash marn and toski wall van tilburg carpenter mccreary and utley thank you chris uh, seeing the names on the screen i, I i'm remiss in not uh, telling folks at the outset that we had regrets tonight from both uh, the mayor and from uh, Councillor Weaver, who uh, you remember is on a medical leave of absence for a period of time uh, from his duties at council. And we are wishing him all the best as he continues to recover. Uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, you had asked, you were first out of the queue. You asked for 6.14 to be uh, separated. Would you like to go ahead with that item, please? Thank you, Chair McCurry. Um, I believe this, I don't know if I saw him in in page number two over here, I think it's for, for Mr. Brian Hughes, if he is in the room. If not, I'm searching for someone. There he is. Mr. Hughes, how are you? I'm good, Councillor. How are you? Good, 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 good. With regard to this issue, um, we um, I'm wondering if there's any language that we can add into this contract that would ensure uh, that not only this group, but the other groups as well, um, focus on, on using, using the parking lot, Mr. Hughes. Uh, I've been, I've been receiving quite a few complaints from the neighborhood about all the, all the uh, repairs that have to happen to the turf when people are parking on the grass. Um, we probably don't want them parking there in the first place. And it becomes a little bit of a problem when, uh, as far as safety and security of pedestrians and mixed traffic and, and, and whatnot. Is, is there anything that we could do to add that into our contract so that they understand that their primary responsibility for safety reasons in and out of that rental situation is to use uh, the parking lot that's existing there at, at, at the moment? Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I think we can. I think we can certainly add that into rental contracts or lease agreements, whatever documents uh, pertain to the situation. Thank you. I see, I see Ron popped his, his head up there too. Uh, through the chair. Uh, yeah, just to follow up on Brian's comments, we can certainly um, drop that into any lease agreement that restricts the parking onto the parking services. And if there is any damage uh, as a result of parking on the grass, then you know it certainly will be the responsibility of the uh, the tenant to repair that. Okay, yeah, and, and the word uh, to be quite clear, uh, Ron and, and Brian, the, the word is not if I, I, I've actually witnessed the uh, the the behavior and the uh, the damages to the uh, to the turf in the area, uh, and especially uh, crossing over the pedestrian walkways in the area. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a situation that does need some attention. I believe another department outside of your two departments is having a look at it as well for corrective measures, but I just wanted to be sure that um, if we include that into the language of the contract for uh, this group and a few other groups uh, that are interested in the same type of behavior, that we can actually pull the contract back up and say, hey, hey listen, you know, we're, we're trying to keep the park nice. Can you help us out, right? Thank you, I appreciate it. Your, uh, your answers. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor, may I suggest that you put your hand back up and uh, bring that as an amendment? Uh, Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you. Through you to staff, you indicate that it's, it's possible that the tenant can be responsible for paying for restoration of, of lawn areas. Has that been done in the past with this group? Uh, through the chair. Um, historically, I am not aware of, of that. I can certainly um, find that information out. Maybe Mr. Hughes has that information. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Councillor Martin, we have uh, approached the, uh, the uh, tenant in this case in previous years. I think it was uh, a different president or a, a different organizing board or board of management at that time to uh, remediate some of the repairs that uh, were needed with the grass along Edge Street and, and so forth. And we also took action and, uh, and actually uh, put some bollards and stones up to try to uh, prevent vehicles from parking there. But I do believe they have been approached in the past. It's probably been a few years now though, uh, with regards to some of the repairs that were required. 
And was that approach successful? Did they pay, pay for the restoration? Through you, Mr. Chair, they paid for part of it, but the problem continued. The problem was ongoing. So it, it was like we, we would have it repaired. And then, you know, within a month or two, we were back to where we started. And, and they didn't seem to keep up their end of the deal with regards to enforcing their users to use the parking lot and stay off the street and stay off the grass. So it, it was an ongoing struggle. But I think stronger language in the lease would certainly help us uh, amend that situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, go ahead. There's nobody else in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, by your recommendation, yeah, I'll <laughs> bring an amendment to the table, uh, which then would apply um, uh, um, Mr. Hughes to all of the lands at Lions Park, which are subject to rental agreements with different user groups with the direction in addition to what you've already admit, uh, written to direct them to use the parking lot at all times. I hope that, uh, hope that is clear enough. Thank you. Would somebody care to second that, please? Councillor Martin, thank you very much. Any debate on the, um, the uh, amendment before us? Councillor Wall, go ahead, you have the floor. I don't know why I raised my hand. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, is there currently signage that says something of the like at the site? Through you, Mr. Chair, there's limited signage. There, there is some on the site uh, that is uh, fairly well ignored. Uh, and the, the people just seem to park there anyways and, and just basically ignore whatever signage is there or whatever barriers we put in place, uh, they seem to drive around them. So whether it be the Edge Street side, we also have a similar problem on the opposite side near the, uh, near the first ball diamond where users of the ball diamond prefer to park on the grass than within the parking lot. So uh, we've got signs up um, and we don't want to just create sign pollution in the park, if you will, uh, with, with signs everywhere. There's also a bylaw in place that obviously says that they can't park there. They have been ticketed. We've had assistance from police in the past as well to ticket some people that have parked illegally, uh, but the problem seems to continue unfortunately. So it's not necessarily a problem of the rules not being posted. It's a problem with the rules not being followed. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, I agree with that. And um, most of our bylaw signs are posted on the actual park entry sign. So we'll have them, you know, there's a major entry sign that names the park and, and relays all, all the bylaws on that sign in order that we don't just pollute the park with with signs for every violation that's possible. So that's how we try to control it and try to control the, uh, the parking situation. In some cases, we do need to put up barricades. And in some cases, we do need to put up additional signs. And in this case, it's actually along the road allowance where the problem is occurring uh, in addition to inside the park. So there are two various, there are two different locations that we're uh, trying to deal with in, the, in this situation. So then maybe just a statement, perhaps a question of sorts. We have those like yellow signs that we use that we post when something's going to happen. Is it worthwhile to even investigate temporary signage that basically says like, hey, please follow the posted rules because if you don't, your kid's team's going to get fined? Because like no parent wants to be responsible for the rates of their kids thing going up because now they're organizing like, I don't want to find these organizations. I don't like it's the last thing I want to do is vote here today to support something that's going to cause these organizations. But no one's immune to the rules. We live in a society of rules and they're supposed to be followed. And I just, I wonder if it's because of ignorance or blatant disregard of the law. And I really just want to be optimistic and think that it's ignorance. That's true, Mr. Chair. What, we are trying different uh, techniques to try to, to combat the situation. We're using portable signs, typ typical to the, uh, to the science counselors would use during the election period with the, the, the aluminum rods that basically stick into the ground. And we have a, like a courtesy sign trying to uh, say nicely, please don't park on the grass, keep off the grass, that type of thing. We can move them around to different locations. So we're trying that now to, uh, to see how, what kind of response we get. Okay. And what, and whether so they specific comply. to that, Brian, right. there was a sign that the city of Brantford made that went viral on social media about walking dogs. And it was something along the lines of like making sure the owner was on a leash instead of the dog was on a leash. I don't know if that was a legit sign or if that was actually, but like, have we considered being cheeky 
Have we considered, you know, advertising the rules, but in a more cheeky way? Through you, Counselor, that, that was a sign that staff did develop with regards to the, uh, the dogs and, and the leashes, and it was uh, intended to be humorous. Something like, we wouldn't park on your grass, don't park on ours, you know? Mm -hmm. I, and the, the, the signs we're currently using, the signs that we're currently testing and trying are similar to that. They are of a less enforcement nature and more of a good neighbor kind of uh, approach to say, you know, please, res please respect the area. So that's, that's what we're time, I'm afraid. Oh, yeah, no, that's okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Councillor uh, Carpenter, you have the floor. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Acting Mayor McCurry. Uh, just uh, uh, the, the amendment, I, I'd like to be clear about the amendment. I need some clarity on it. It, uh, it seemed to suggest that we were going to deal with any event at this location about the, the grass and uh, we're, we're dealing with the ball hockey lease agreement. Could I get some clarification of what from staff, what they think the amendment is? Because we don't have it in front of us. Councillor, I believe the amendment would apply to the item before us, regardless of what the wording may have been previously. So it's so just it would, apply, it would apply strictly to this um, this item before us. And if the councillor moving the amendment wanted something else included, it probably would be best to come back as a as a bigger piece at another day. Okay, thank you. Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would hope that uh, staff would see this as, as direction when other leases come up and uh, and take a proactive approach to making these kind of changes in, in other leases. Um, the staff indicated that they've had success with the police ticketing people. Is this something that we could get our own parking enforcement to, uh, or bylaw officers to, to ticket cars that park on the grass? Because we'll be able to get more tickets out that way than uh, by by relying on the police. Through you, uh, Chair McCree. Uh, oh, Mark's jumped on, but we have blitzed this area before. It's similar to what Brian is saying that it just continues to happen. We have um, one resource that does the whole city, so we you know we have to look at that as well. But. Um, we have blissed the area before, and we could again when when it picks up. But uh, it's a it's a repeating thing. Mark, if you want to add anything else, through the chair, I'm Mark Jackman, director of operational services. Yeah, just to add to Indy's point, you know, we we have had the uh, parking enforcement out to deliver tickets. Um, you have to understand. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets you know we have baseball going at once, ball hockey going at once, hockey going at once. Uh, there's a track maybe going on at once as well. There's a number of people, long tournaments. Um, and when we send one person out there to uh, ticket, um, sometimes it does cause some issues. Um, so, you know, obviously like almost a gang mentality where they go after this one person who's writing tickets for everybody. So we have to be very careful. We can't put people at risk. And that's why it is important that uh, we also get some assistance from the police uh, but yes, yeah, so to understand the police are also quite busy themselves dealing with other issues. So we do do a coordinated approach as much as possible in order to uh, help relieve the uh, parking issues there. Great. Thank you very much. Councillor, thank you. Uh, Councillor Celeste, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. C could I get staff to please put the uh, amendment up on the screen? Yeah, the, the, the I don't know whether it's, it's I think it's to be implied, but but it doesn't specifically say that uh, should people park on the grass, uh, the cost of, of repairing the grass will be burdened by the uh, by the leasee, and and it doesn't uh, it, it it doesn't say that uh, if I read this, it just it, it's just a statement. It doesn't say who's responsible for what. Are, are staff clear on that? Because it's not clear in the uh, in the amendment the way it's worded on the screen. Councillor, would you like to propose a fix for that? Uh, well, I I think the idea um, I'll, I'll let staff staff wordsmith it, but I think the idea is that in the lease it, it contains that the uh, the person leasing that the ball hockey uh, folks will direct their customers to not park on the grass, but to park on the parking lot. And should customers park on the lawn? 
uh, they will be responsible for restoring that lawn to its original uh, condition. Staff, I think that was that the clarity. Uh, Ron? Yeah, through, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, staff certainly understand what the intent is that you're trying to achieve here. And um, we will certainly relay that and pen it in the, in the lease agreement. Uh, we have the pen, so we have the power uh, when we drop these agreements. And, you know, they want to be there. Um, you know, we've had discussions with the owner and he understands and, and he wants to comply and, and be a good, uh, you know, a good tenant and uh, make sure that uh, uh, he can exist. So we will certainly, I will work with legal to ensure that uh, the intent of, of what, you're, uh, what you're saying will be in the agreement as per any damage caused by parking illegally on the grass will be the responsibility of, of the tenant, the Ball Hockey International. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I see no further uh, requests to speak on the amendment, so I'll ask Chris to go to the vote, please. The amendment to item 6.1.4 carries on a recorded vote of eight to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sles, Marn, Antoski, Van Tilburg, Carpenter, McCreary, Utley. Those opposed, Councillor Wall. Chris, thank you. So back now to the main motion as amended once. Any further discussion, folks? Then we'll go to the question. Item 6.1.4, as amended, carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sles, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Van Tilburg, Carpenter, McCreary, and Nutley. Uh, thank you. Councillor Carpenter, I'm gonna to go to you now because you had asked to separate 6.11 firstly. Okay, thank you. Acting Mayor McCreary, I gotta to get to my 6.11. Okay, yes, um, just a question. Uh, in, in C, it says it proposed that we proceed with the hiring of a consultant to conduct a one-year review. Do we have an idea what the cost of the consultant is and where the funding is coming from for this, this consultant that we're approving here today? Mr. Hutchings. Yes, so you, uh, Chair McCreary, we don't have an idea of the consultant item. One of the, one of the recommendations last year when we, we uh, finished this report in October, if you remember the night, it was about 84 different uh, recommendations that, that the clerk had to change. But item number D was that we come back in a year and do, an, uh, do a review of this. Look at uh, page three of the report. Council adopt a recommendation that council conduct a priority session view in one year time. So we have not budgeted for that. Um, I'm thinking it's anywhere between ten to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, Councilor, Councilor Carpenter. I, that we haven't gone out yet. What I was required to do is do this report and then get a barometer. If Council wanted to go forth and still do this with one year left in your term, thirty-eight percent of the thing of the matters are done. There's still sixty-two percent. There's a fair bit still to move ahead on, and so uh, there's lots still over the next year to to do, and we can report back on this next year again. But that's why it's there, Councillor, make sure Council still wants to do this and pay for a consultant or staff. I could try to find a staff member to do a facilitation, but usually it's nice to have that distance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like item C separate, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Carpenter, for separating that. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you did that. Is there any further discussion on this item? Then um, uh, I could ask the clerk to go to the question, please. Through the chair, would you like to vote on clauses A to B first and then C? I will leave that entirely in your hands, Chris. Sure. So I've put up a clauses A to B first.
clauses A and B of item 6.1.1 carries unanimously on a recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Van Toborg, Carpenter, McCreary, and Utley. Clause C of item 6.1.1 is lost on recorded vote of one to seven. Members voting in favor, Councillor Utley. Members opposed, Councillors Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, and Toborg, Carpenter, and McCreary. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, it's back to you for 6.1.3. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor McCreary. Uh, just a question to staff. Uh, we're looking to buy this property uh, for the acquisition amount of $800,000 uh, from the utility. Uh, the property was used before for storing, uh, I believe, uh, old transformers. Do we know that the property has been, will be received in a, a condition that is safe and that the, a record of site condition will be a, as part of that in advance? Um, Ron Gasparato, manager of real estate through the chair. Um, as part of the agreement of purchase and sale process, we are going to uh, go through a, um, an environmental condition to uh, determine if there is contamination on the property. As the property did store old transformers that hadn't been uh, depleted of what was then a very dangerous uh, product inside. And in fact, if I recall this property from my old days in the PUC, this had also had drainage in it to drain and it might have spilled there to uh, another site. Well, all, all that will be investigated is what you're saying before the purchase of sale? That is correct. And will the purchase of sale come back to us without letting us know what the conditions are and, and uh, what shape they're in? Um, we could certainly provide a confidential memo to council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Antoski, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my question is along the same line. I'm, I'm trying to understand timelines a little bit, Ron, if you can help me. Um, certainly, we're going to look at the environmental aspect of this first, but the recommendation is, is to, to purchase the property before the end of 2021. So, so we're doing a purchase on condition and, and, uh, and how long do we expect the environmental assessment to take? Um, through the chair, um, typically, uh, due diligence of that uh, nature, you could probably 60 days, or maybe 90 days at the most. Okay, and is that that's a cost borne by by us? Yeah. That is correct. Any idea of the cost of that? It's important. It's an important cost. I just just wondering. <laughs> um, through the chair, I I don't have an estimate on on what um, you know that type of testing will cost. I imagine it's going to be some geotech. Uh, work for some borehole testing, but I, I don't have that number. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Van Tilburg, you have the floor. Go ahead, please. Yeah. How did we come up with the figure, the purchase price figure? Thank you. Through the chair, uh, there was an appraisal conducted by uh, Allens and Associates to determine um, in, uh, the appraised value. And so with regards to the possible information that Councillor Carpenter mentioned, um, would they have any lingerings of that within their appraisal or is this just a, it's land, this is in the north, it's, it's in the industrial sector, this is what it goes for? Through the chair, that is correct. Uh, they don't make assumptions for uh, environmental because they're not you know, professionals in environmental. Uh, their values are based on you know, clean land. Um, well, who hired the consultant to come with the figure? Uh, the city. Whose property is this? Through the chair, this is uh, BPI's property. Why wouldn't they come to us with a price? Um, we approached BPI for the acquisition of these lands. And then they said, you guys do an assessment and come up with a price and whatever that is, we're good with it. 
through the chair, that's correct. Um, I just want to make sure this is all clear and understood. Yes. So, so my my question now that's that's the lay of the land. And so my question now is if there is something there that we fear um, obtaining, will either the deal be able to be ex extract ourselves from it or renegotiate a price? Are those options still out on the table? Uh, through the chair, absolutely. The, Thank you know. very much. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear and clear to everybody that may be paying attention. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wall, go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, I'm looking at page two of the staff report, and it just says that uh, it's $800,000, but staff believe that 50% of the purchase costs can be recovered from the development charges and then purchasing the property in 2021 will result in an overall cost savings of 310,000 up to 500,000 to the capital project. Could you just elaborate on that? Because I mean, to anybody watching or just listening, it's $800,000, but now it's suddenly maybe $400,000 with 310 to $500,000 cost saving. Are those the same thing? Is 50% where that 310, 500,000 is, or is it 50% savings and still? Just explain that to me. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Selvi Congera, Director of Environmental Services. Um, uh, Councillor, what we are looking at is uh, just construction cost to savings alone. Uh, it's an estimate uh, of the savings, which is like a three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. So that is the cost savings from construction that's uh, going to be undertaken which is the expansion of the station. So 50% what we're talking about, DC recovery development charges recovery, it's just based on how much of the expansion is serving the new growth. That's how the 50% recovery is talked about. Um, so both are not related if that uh, is of any help to you. It's a DC development charge means it's a funding source. Um, the savings we're talking about is how much we save by having the space in our current expansion project. Hope that makes sense. I'm going to tell you what I think you said, and then you can tell me if I'm right. So if it's $800,000 and then we get potentially 50% back through DC charges, which is paid for by development, development charges, that's $400,000. And then we could potentially save from this acquisition up to five hundred thousand. That is that not a hundred thousand dollars surplus? Um, it doesn't exactly work out that way. So let me uh, try to explain that. Um, so the construction cost of the MP station expansion is fifteen point one million dollars. Oh. So in that fifteen point one, we may not have to spend fifteen point one. If say if we save five hundred thousand, we may have to spend fourteen point six million in the project cost. And so whatever may be either fifteen or fourteen point six in that cost, fifty percent we will recover or we plan to recover from development charges. So 7 million would be recovered from development charges, or, or sorry, 7.25 or 7.5 million would be recovered from development charges. So we're, we're talking about two different things in terms of the funding source against construction cost savings. Yep, you made it make sense. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, thank you. Um, let me ask a question since there's nobody in the queue, uh, Ron. Uh, I know the answer to this question, but I'm sure the folks out there watching uh, might be wondering why we have to buy a piece of land from a company that we own 100% of the shares of. Uh, could you provide that answer, please? Um, through the chair, certainly. Oh, I'm actually going to defer this to, to Kim Jolie, city solicitor. Thank you very much. Through the chair, Kim Jolie, city solicitor. I, uh, these are two related companies. So yes, we do own the company, but because this is a related company also governed by uh, several pieces of legislation which deal with how it can uh, treat the affiliates that it has. So the companies that are related to it, we have to be careful in how we approach this. And that is why this is approached as a sale transaction on a market basis. So the appraisal is necessary in order for us to determine what fair market value of that land would be. 
and as related entities governed by the legislation that we are, we are required to purchase the property at fair market value. So the rules in essence uh, require us to buy the same piece of property two times. I don't expect an answer to that, thank you. Um, anything else folks on this item? Oh, Councilor Carper, go ahead, please. <laughs> thank you, Acting Mayor McCurry. I, I'm laughing about buying it. It was the Public Utilities Commission that bought it the first time uh, and the city took them over. So it wouldn't be a second time buy just to correct that. But uh, I, I didn't want to uh, suggest that this wasn't a good deal. I just wanted to make sure that we checked for a place that used to store PCBs in that we want to make sure that it's uh, it's safe and the staff have said they're going to do that. Uh, I think it's a good acquisition. We have a couple of uh, uh, deals we're doing with the uh, hydro utility and I'm sure that's before any possible acquisition uh, or amalgamation before we ha end up having uh, a more difficult time to do them. And I, I suggested that will be on, the, that's why they're here. So the question would be, would we be able to have this done before any possible acquisition or merger of the utilities. I could speak to that uh, through you, uh, Councilor McCreary, Chair McCreary. The short answer is that's 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 yes. Why it's one of the reasons why it's here, Councilor Carpenter. If that were to happen, uh, the possibility of merger would happen January first, and this would be completed by that that time, that point in time, uh, Councilor Carpenter. Okay, and both items on our agenda that dealing with those will be completed by then. Thank you, I, I suspect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Martin, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, since the Bradford Power doesn't really have this money built into its budget, it's quite possible that we'll see this money come back to the city by a special dividend prior to the merger going forward. So this might end up being a wash in the end. Excellent point, Councillor. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, no further requests to speak. We'll uh, we'll go to the vote, please. Item six point one point three: Acquisition of thirty seven MP Street from Branford Power Incorporated. Cares unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows: Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Van Tilburg, Carpenter, McCreary, and Nutley. Uh, Chris, thank you for that. Councillor Carpenter, it's over to you again for item six point two point two. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, which member of staff uh, is responsible for this report that I can speak to? Is it, would it be Joel or is it somebody else? The chair, Councilor Carpenter, it's uh, our golf operations. Uh, Joel, Joel could be assistance if there's any questions. Okay, I got, I got a couple of, I got a couple of questions. One of them being, uh, when, we, when we look at the term goods, in item one, four, five, one Oh one of, of the, uh, the budget, we, we, uh, for, for example, for Walter Gretzky, we, uh, the actual was $46,908 in goods, and we budgeted 38,000, and we're told in the report that we had uh, a shorter year. So why would we have had more goods than budgeted on a shorter year? And the opposite was true with Airedale. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Joel Daniels, Director of Finance, City Treasurer. Um, I'm, can you just refer me to the page that you're referring to? Well, it's page one of, a, um, of, of the budget report. And on the front page under expenses, it has uh, higher expenses for goods than what was budgeted for 2020. Uh, and it, it seems we spent more money on goods on a shorter year. I'm just trying to understand that. Um, Okay, uh, I I would need to refer back to golf staff to explain no, that, the fine. variance in that line item. Okay, and uh, there's also an item here called internal payments. Do, do I do we know what they are? Internal payments to you, or is that something else I need to get you to refer back, Joel? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So internal charges would would be um, items where perhaps another de department performed a service for golf and we do make those internal charges. Okay, kind of like overhead charges then? It'd be mostly for items such as perhaps postage or um, uh, mail use of the mail room, those kinds of 
<laughs> or if signage was created um, by operational services, minor transactions like that. We do. And Joel, would we, would we be able to set up a time for you and myself and, and uh, maybe uh, golf operations to answer some other questions that I have where, I, where we could actually speak more frankly um, and I could have more, more detail in the questions? Is that possible? We could do that with a Zoom with three of us? Yes, I suspect we could coordinate that uh, with golf operation staff. Yes. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Councilor, thank you. Councilor Wall, you have the floor. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Chairman Curry. Uh, Joel, if you can come back for just a second. Thanks. Um, I received an email from a concerned constituent tonight that asked me to question the Arrowdale golf numbers. But there was no more direction than that other than to question them. So I'm going to try to understand the question a bit better and ask you, one, who provides the audit or the report on the numbers? It's purely city staff. And then in the event that that is true, is it reasonable or even possible to request a third party audit of the Aerodale golf numbers? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, uh, certainly the financial information is the responsibility of staff to prepare uh, reports for a uh, year end, but the overall 2020 um, city financial information, including that of golf, golf operations, is performed as part of the annual budget process perform, performed by our external um, auditing firm, which is currently Millard's. Okay, so it's already done by a third party. So forgive me, I'm asking a question directly here on behalf of the constituent. They're asking me to question the Arrowdale numbers. So in your opinion, as the person who's in charge and director of finance for the city of Brantford, is there any reason that we ought to question the numbers for Arrowdale? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, staff is confident that the, um, all the transactions that took place um, are valid. Um, perhaps uh, the operational staff would like to add to that, but I can confirm as part of the city's annual audit uh, that audit does include golf as well as all the other city services. In the event that I were to direct this constituent to speak to somebody to perhaps answer any questions that I didn't ask on their behalf here today, would I direct them directly to you or would there be an opportunity for them to even speak to the person who audited our numbers? Yeah, uh, Councillor Wall, you could certainly direct uh, direct them to me and I can address their questions and prepare a response for them. I appreciate it. I will do so now. Thank you. Councillor, thank you. Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a quick question. The, the internal payments, would that include charges for fleet, uh, which would compensate for all the vehicles that they utilize during the year? Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the fleet line and the budget is a separate line that is okay. not within the internal charges. Uh, internal charges would include, though, which wasn't mentioned, horticultural services. So the horticultural department provides services to golf and then are, are compensated and, and paid back for the flowers and the displays and the gardening and things like that uh, that are performed. So that is a, that's another example of, a, of an internal charge. Okay, thank you. Councillor, thank you. I see no further requests to speak, so we will go to the vote on this item. Item 6.2.2, Golf Operations Year End Report 2020, CARES on recorded vote of eight to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Slas, Martin, Antoski, Wall, Utley, McCreary, Carpenter. Those opposed, Councillor Van Tilburg. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, so that concludes the items for um, consideration. We've dealt with consent items as well. Uh, we move on now to resolutions. Uh, first is 7.1, and um, Councillor Carpenter, that's your resolution about the always stop at Gray and Garden Avenue. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Acting Mayor McCurry. It's moved by myself and seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Sherilyn Toski, where several requests for always stop control has been received, and whereas always stop location has been requested at Garden Avenue and Gray Street, 
and where speed humps have been requested at Garden Avenue north of Gray Street and south of Elgin. And whereas Garden Avenue is, is not a truck route, but has several violations by trucks every day, and whereas development in the area has created a significant increase in vehicular traffic on the local streets, and whereas council approved the Garden Avenue traffic calming resolution March 23rd, 2021, and director staff to conduct traffic studies on Garden Avenue determine if existing conditions warrant traffic calming and therefore be resolved that staff be directed to send letters to Garden Avenue residents for the purpose of receiving their responses and their concerns with respect to consideration of an always stop at the intersection and, and speed humps and on the street and that that staff be directed to complete the always stop patrol warrant studies and report back in Q3 2020 with responses from the public engagement and the results of the warrant studies and that Staff be directed to review truck route signage on the said section of Garden Avenue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could make a suggestion to uh, the Ward 4 councillors, we have the same problem with trucks on Morton Ave, and we have uh, several con uh, constituents who complain about it, and we get them to take down the plate numbers of the vehicles. And, uh, and under the vehicle and, and staff have been uh, very good at sending letters to the companies uh, that are using the, of the trucks that are using the uh, non-truck routes and it, it's having some effect and I think it's it's something that uh, hopefully will will eventually have the effect that we want and, and get trucks off our non-truck route areas. Councilor, thank you. And perhaps we'll quit uh, giving the same names to residential streets as we give to commercial truck road streets. Um, I see no other requests to speak, so we'll go to the vote. Item Item 7.1, always stop control at Gray Street and Garden Avenue and speed humps on Garden Avenue north of Gray Street carries unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee will voting in favor as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Van Tilburg, Carpenter, McCreary, and Nutley. Thank you, Chris. Councillor Antoski, 7.2, tell us about the year of the garden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll do it from here. One second. This will be better. I can see it better. Thank you. Uh, whereas the city of Brantford is committed to being a garden friendly city, supporting the development of its garden culture. And whereas the city has a rich tradition of horticultural excellence with more than 180 floral gardens and municipal parks and along city streets, uni unique mosaic and carpet bed uh, displays, as well as annual plantings that enhance public art and historic monuments throughout the community and within the downtown. And whereas Equal Ground Community Gardens coordinates and supports more than 20 active community gardens throughout the city, an initiative that is maintained fully by community residents and volunteers to provide places for growing local healthy and nutritious fruits and vegetables in urban neighborhoods. And whereas the city is proud to be home to landscapes that demonstrate a growing commitment to environmental sustainability and climate action, including an emphasis on water conservation and the use of native plants and species providing food and habitat for bees and other pollinators. And whereas gardens and gardening contribute to the quality of life of our municipality and create safe and healthy places where people can come together and the entire country is being asked to proclaim 2022 to as the year of the garden. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Brantford actively participate in the year of the garden by promoting beautification initiatives, enhancing plant planting citywide, encouraging resident engagement, and creating a supporting media campaign, and that staff be directed to prepare a plan for 2022 that highlights Brantford's gardening excellence and commitment to environmental sustainability, along with the required budget to the to be submitted to the Estimates Committee for consideration through the 2022 budget process, and C, that the resolution be shared with the Federation of, Community, of Canadian Municipalities, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Member of Parliament and Member of Provincial Parliament for Brantford Brant, the County of Brant, and all Ontario municipalities. And if I may speak to this briefly, Mr. Ch Chair. Um, we we proclaimed this recently, and this is an initiative, it's a national initiative that's being pushed out 
um, well, obviously across the country. And I, I think that there are many benefits to this. And um, one of my regrets um, as a new councillor, one of my, my voting regrets that I have is uh, as a new councillor, we were at estimates and we were looking for ways to cut budgets. And one of the places that we cut budgets were in our beautiful um, garden displays. And I remember thinking, well, I guess it's an easy way and everything else seems so important. And for anybody who's lived in Brantford for any length of time, if you remember what Brantford looked like in regard to our plantings and you close your eyes and you look at it now, it looks very different. And for such a simple thing, um, and it really adds to the community, I, I fear that we create our own broken window kind of syndrome when we take these things away. KPMG has, has told us how efficient our greenhouses are. We have a really dedicated and passionate staff there and creative. I mean, we, we have been, we've got a proud history of gardens and I think we need to bring that back. I think it's also a great way as we start coming out of COVID to bring our residents back uh, together and working together at, in a combined way with something that really enhances our city and makes them feel good about the, their own properties and our properties um, that are public spaces. So, so I hope that we'll get support for this. We all need something to feel good and happy about and something that helps our city and, and really makes it that beautiful place that people want to move to because you drive into it and it's lovely and you feel good. And um, and I know our staff can come up with some, some great plans. The uh, the committee that is running this um, to the feds and, and nationally, they're coming up with a whole bunch of different little programs that uh, cities can um, collaborate with and uh, providing a toolbox. So, so I hope we'll get support on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor, thank you. And Councillor Carpenter, you have the floor. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor McCurry. And I wonder if staff, when they come back at estimates with the, the cost for this, they could either they could also separate the cost of our floral gardens. And I think we make contributions to community gardens. I believe it's 20,000 or I think it's 20,000, but that's uh, not uh, as apparent as it could be, but could we, could we make, put a, this all together as part of the estimates process so we know what our, our community gardens are, you know, what our flower costs, so everything is, is together. So we're aware of what we're approving when it comes to estimates. It's, it's clearer that way, thank you. And I support this uh, on behalf of my ward mate. Thank you, Councillor, and we'll go to the vote. Item 7.2. Year of the Garden 2022 carries unanimously on a recorded vote of 9 to 0. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Spannerstelt, Sless, Marn, Antoski, Wall, and Tilburg, Carpenter, McCreary, and Utley. Thank you, Chris. And now it's over to Councillor Utley for 7.3, Waterfront Park. Thank you, Chair McCreary. You're doing a fine job tonight. Moved by myself and seconded by my ward mate, uh, Councillor Slipsless. Whereas there is a desire to increase the number of public parks in the city that overlook the beautiful Grand River, where citizens and visitors can enjoy the beauty of Brantford's natural heritage. And whereas for many years, there have been numerous meetings regarding the enhancement of our waterfront, primarily through the waterfront master plan. And whereas the city trail system meanders along both sides of the Grand River that runs through our city, and whereas improving the access to the Grand River through a series of parks that overlook the Grand River would be ideal resting spots for hikers, bicycle riders, and families. And whereas there will be connections to the Mohawk Lake District, Brant's Crossing, and Dam areas. And whereas the city of Brantford acquired lands along Grand River Ave between Scarf, Church, and Waterloo, east of the Grand River, and adjacent to the Dyke Trail as an initiative of the Waterfront Master Plan. And whereas this property consists of approximately 1.25 acres, and whereas environmental site assessment studies have been completed and $650,000 in potential funding has been allocated in the city's 10-year capital budget, 
to begin the environmental risk management plan in 2022 and design in 2023. Now therefore be it resolved, A, that staff be directed to retain a consultant to develop a park design concept and complete any investigative studies required for lands along Grand River Ave between Scarf and Church and Waterloo East of the Grand River as an initiative of the Waterfront Master Plan that includes one, a vision and concept of the Waterfront Park project, two, public information centers to share the vision and concepts with residents and stakeholders and request input to be incorporated into the design. Three, to maximize the view of the Grand River from the potential waterfront park. Four, parking plan during construction phase and a permanent parking plan for visitors to the waterfront park. Five, provide an estimate, estimated construction, implementation and operating and maintenance cost for the waterfront park. And B, that staff be directed to provide a funding source in the 2022 capital budget for the consulting services and report back to city council to present the final version of concept plan in Q4 2022. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, if, if I've got any time left, um, this uh, I, I see a vision of this as a uh, the land being brought up to the same level as the dike, maybe a little bit higher, uh, potentially have a small band shell on that site for unamplified music where we can all go down there and sing songs or play guitars or flutes or whatever. Book it for an hour. Um, it, it has a strong connection and I will hope that the design, if it's approved, will connect, be favorable to the vision that we have for the Mohawk Lake district site. Um, I think it'll be a great addition to our community um, in the downtown area, especially uh, if we look at, you know, the things we've discussed earlier tonight uh, with, you know, with the um, small theatre, small cultural uh, group uh, hub, um, possibly small food and cafes that people can stop, have a coffee, uh, talk to friends, um, have a playground area for children and families, and possibly a picnic area uh, as well. So I'll, I'll leave it at uh, that, uh, Mr. Chair, and... Uh, Hope Council will support this, this very first phase of this project. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Celeste, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Councillor Rockney and I have been, been uh, discussing and working on this for, for quite some time now. And uh, everything that, that uh, Councillor uh, Utley said, I, I certainly agree with. And, and what he didn't say was there is a potential, and we've been working on this again for some time, to enlarge this park uh, uh, many fold. Uh, and we're working um, for the acquisition of land, I guess, <clears throat> that would uh, potentially come into city uh, ownership. And we've been working again on, on that for probably three or four years now. And I, I think we're getting to the point where we're soon, I think would have something that we can uh, bring to, uh, to council to, uh, to peruse and, and uh, you know, to pass judgment on. So I, I would encourage everybody to support this. I, 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 the one thing that you hear about people uh, in Brantford say about our river is it's beautiful, but you can't see it from anywhere unless you're on a bridge. Uh, and, and that's very true. And I, I saw some kind of strange looks on the screen when, when Councilor Rodney said to elevate the, uh, the park up to a, a, a level of the dike so that you can actually see the river. Uh, what we're talking about is backfilling the, uh, that entire area up uh, so that you can sit in, in a lawn chair uh, 40 feet back from the uh, river and see the river. Uh, right now, you can't do that, really. I don't think we have a place where you can actually do that. So that's that's the vision. Uh, again, uh, I think we talked about starting processes this evening. This is uh, the start of a long journey. It won't be built next year or the year after. But if it's not started at some point, it will never be built. So I, I think the, the object of, of the resolution that Councillor Otley has put forward this evening is to start a process of looking at this and how it can be achieved. So I would hope everybody would support this, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sluss. Any further discussion? Councillor Carpenter, go ahead, please. 
Yes, again, some clarity in the resolution because the resolution says, number A, that staff be directed to retain a consultant. That means right away. That means staff are to hire a consultant. And I don't see a budget number to hire this consultant. Uh, does staff have any idea what this consultant would cost that they would be hiring? No, I'm getting. Sorry, through you, uh, Chair McCurry. Uh, so Councilor Carpenter, this consultant would be retained to do some of the environmental work that's required just to make sure uh, the site is clean and whatnot. There was some work done in the past. Um, in 2014, I believe, uh, park staff are here, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but there is some other work that needs to be done. And um, to provide an estimate, it'd be tough because I don't know what we'll find, but uh, probably in the range of 20 to 30,000 for a ESA of what work we need to do. But that is an estimate, again, I'm not This sure. is for an environmental consultant. Is this just for water, the waterfront or waterfront park itself? In the, in the area that's described in the resolution. Okay, and then the report would come back to us with cost uh, cost of, 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 of all this all this. So we're, and we're, this is this is a fully a wholly new project. Through you, uh, Chair McCurry, yes, and we'd most likely be bringing a project to estimates for for the capital project. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Did I see your hand go up and then come down? You are very uh, astute. Yes, you did, okay. and I'm good. Okay, thank you, Councillor Martin. Go ahead, please, you have the floor. Thank you, through you to staff. Do we currently own what used to be the railway that uh, went through this area? Through you, Chair McCurry. Uh, to my knowledge, Ron can correct me if I'm wrong. I know he knows the map way better than I do on, on GIS, but uh, I believe we do own parts of it. There are some areas in behind the houses, I believe that we may not. Um, if not, then live just a little bit further up towards the, the next street. Um, sorry, it's escaped me the name of that street, but uh, there's potential development there. But uh, majority of it, I believe we do own. We were going to go back after our site meeting with Councillor Lee to go and look at uh, the rest of the ownership. Okay. And, uh... Because if we don't own that, that'll involve a retaining wall on, on both sides of this park. Because uh, it's going to need, what, about 10 feet of fill? And to bring it up to the level of the dike? Yeah, through yeah. Chair McCree, it's, it's quite a bit of fill. And, and there's also parking there. So, you know, depending on how much we need and where and how the site's laid out, um, it's all going to be dependent on what we bring in and how we design it. Yeah, okay. So... 10 feet of fill on one and a quarter acres, that's gonna be a huge expense. Uh, we don't have a budget for that. We don't have a budget for the consultant. Uh, I think it's just too pricey a project at this point. Uh, we talked about a park on, on this property before and I suggested at the time Dykeview Park because you can't see the river from there. And uh, bringing it up will still, if you're anyways a distance back from, from the dike, you still won't be able to see the river unless you're uh, sitting in a 10 foot chair so that you can get a better angle on things. So uh, I, I won't be supporting this tonight. I think this needs a lot more work before we can advance this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Ratley, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to clarify, we're really, this resolution is really to focus primarily on the property from Longbridge down to uh, Church and, uh, and Waterloo Streets, down to Waterloo Street. So um, it takes, you know, it takes time to uh, fill land, and, and I would hope that um, we can get clean fill at a very low cost uh, that can gradually build up that property. Just that alone is going to take a lot of time. I, I don't see the, this park being completed for maybe three, four, five years. But this, um, the intent here is to really get a waterfront park started in, uh, in our downtown area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we shall go to the vote on this item.
through the chair, just waiting on Councillor Utley to submit his vote. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I can't pull that up on my screen, so I'm voting in the affirmative. Item 7.3, Waterfront Park. Carries on recorded vote of five to three. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Sless, Antoski, Wall, Ali, McCurry. Those opposed, Councillors Marn, Carpenter, and Hintelborg. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, uh, could you introduce uh, 7.4? Yes, thank you. And uh, staff will put it up on the screen for me. Whereas the city of Bradford desires to be open and transparent, and whereas democracy is best served when the open and honest discussion occurs in public, and whereas it is sometimes necessary to hold meetings behind closed doors to protect the municipality, and where the technology of today makes it efficient and correct to keep accurate records for the municipality. And whereas if a dispute about the in-camera requirements occur, a third party review would be possible if the said meeting were recorded for accuracy. Now, therefore, it be resolved that City of Brantford implement recording all in-camera meetings and that the clerk be directed to present a bylaw to amend the municipal code, chapter 15 procedural bylaw, uh, for the city procedural bylaw to include the direction of recording of closed session meetings. Thank you. I, I think it's pretty uh, clear. It's just a, a, a way to have recording. It's actually saved the taxpayers money in the sense that if someone did complain, rather than having uh, uh, a review having to be done where interviews of all members of council take place and, the, and this is billed to the taxpayer, taxpayer would pay that bill. Uh, if it's a recorded meeting, uh, the, the uh, the individual that's responsible for dealing with complaints about in-camera meetings would just simply listen to the in-camera meeting and would have all the information necessary and would save the taxpayer money and it'd be far more efficient. So I don't know why anybody wouldn't support this. I know I spoke to a couple of councillors about this before and uh, when they didn't pass and they said they would tend to support it this time. So I'm hoping you'll keep your word and do that this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, let's see, I have Councillor Wall next to the queue. Go ahead, please. Great, thanks, Chairman Curry. Two speaking opportunities, right? Uh, that is correct, yes. Amazing. Who do I ask questions about this to? Is it our lawyer? Yes. Great, you're gonna hate me, I'm sorry. Uh, in advance, um, I'll never forget my first in-camera meeting at City Hall. And uh, I had no idea what in-camera meant. And turns out I'm not the only one because what a stupid name for a private meeting in camera especially when it goes uh, into the newspaper or gets shared on social media because people are like, oh, well, it's in camera. So it's on camera and it's recorded, right? And they don't, I don't wanna like be rude or anything, but some people just don't get that there are matters that we absolutely must meet in camera for. So Heidi, if you don't mind, because you're really great at these answers. Why on earth does the Council of the Corporation of the City of Brantford ever have to meet confidentiality or confidentially like what are some examples of why we would have to meet and it absolutely couldn't possibly be a public meeting so through the chair Heidi DeVries general manager of people legislative services and planning i um, also here to answer questions are is our city solicitor Kimberly Jolly and our deputy clerk Mr. Chris Gauthier but I'll take a first pass at that at that question there there's actually under the municipal act there are reasons um, why the Municipal Council may move in camera that are not mandatory. There were only, I believe, two reasons why it would be mandatory to move in camera, one of which is to consider a report from the Ombudsman, um, sorry, or the, or the um, sorry, I said Ombudsman, but I meant our Integrity Commissioner for closed meeting purposes. I believe the Ombudsman is an Integrity Commissioner for some purposes. So there are only really two reasons that I can think of off the top of my head why you would have to move in camera. Um, as I mentioned, the others are discretionary, and some of those reasons are, you know, litigation. So if we're talking about a case that's before the courts or, or litigation that the municipality is being threatened with, uh, when it comes to strategy and discussions related to that litigation, you may move in camera or behind closed doors to have that discussion. Real estate transactions, so negotiations with respect to the sale of land. You had one here in open session today that was a simple appraised value um, negotiation um, so not a lot that would prejudice the municipality if we were to put property for sale, but in some cases we discuss 
both strategy in terms of how we sell land and the price of that land before we hit the market. So you would be unduly prejudiced as a corporation if you had to have all those discussions in open session. So the legislature has acknowledged that. And I think one of the key reasons why this municipality anyway moves in camera is for uh, labor relations and employee negotiations. So discussions pertaining to your, your workforce, including uh, relations with our unions and negotiating mandates that you give to your HR team uh, before we head into those labor discussions. Um, if you were to have to have all of those discussions in open session, again, it would prejudice you in those negotiations. So those are just a few high level examples. What are the repercussions of just throwing caution to the wind, having every meeting happen in front of the public. So through the chair, um, I, the, the word repercussions is interesting. I think this, this area of the, of the legislation um, is, is enacted because you have the powers of a natural person, you're a corporation at law, and you would be subject to a different set of rules than any other corporation that doesn't have to have those discussions with a camera on you. Um, so you would have a disadvantage in negotiations with respect to the purchase or sale of land, for instance. You would have a disadvantage when it came to negotiating with your employees, both for the contracts for executives and your, your labor unions. And you would basically be showing all of your cards before you head into litigation. So in other words, you probably wouldn't win a lot of legal cases. Um, you may find yourself um, sued more often for having those discussions in open session when they should be subject to confidentiality. You may be disclosing personal information that's otherwise not capable of disclosure under the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. So there are a number of reasons and essentially it disadvantages you in a number of different forums from, again, real estate transactions, labor relations, litigation, etc. Counselor, I'm sorry to say your clock has run out. Put me down for a second opportunity, please. Thank you, Heidi. Counselor. Councillor Vanderstil, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chairman Curry. Um, yeah, the, it, it poses a number of, for me at least, interesting questions about um, where is the data stored? Who maintains the data? Who secures the data? Who keeps the, uh, the data sec uh, secure in terms of uh, who's allowed to have access to the data. Um, so I'm assuming that in a court of law at some point in the future, um, a, a, a court could petition to get data from the municipality. Um, it could be supplied by a council directive or staff just is directed to hand it out. Um, would, a, would a lawyer or a judge or a jury or a, a chief uh, executioner or political ex executioner have access to that data? How, how would it be procured? Um, it, it, adds, it adds an interesting wrinkle to um, all of our in-camera discussions that I can recall over the last uh, very short years on council compared to some in the room. From my perspective, even the meeting that we had earlier today at two o'clock contained uh, information that I, I would hope would would uh, remain uh, in camera, that would remain private because it has to do with employee negotiations. Um, so, I per, perhaps I'll, I'll listen to the rest of the conversation, but uh, please come back to me, Mr. Chair, with a uh, with an amendment if you don't mind. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Schles, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Heidi or Kim, uh, can you give me a, a couple of examples of why the public would want access to the to the minutes uh, or, or, or to the proceedings that go on in in camera? So through the chair, I think if, if we look at the wording of this notice of motion or resolution before you, it's not actually about access to the public. Um, the resolution is worded to assist with closed meeting investigations. So the city has a closed meeting investigator that it has hired. Uh, these investigations in some municipalities take place um, with the help of an ombudsman and the ombudsman has noted that best practices is to record closed meetings. Of course, that's a very self-serving opinion because the ombudsman wants the best evidence possible when reviewing closed meeting investigations, but typically you would look at the complete record, including uh, the clerk's minutes, which are actually the formal record of any closed meeting. Um, but uh, in terms of public access, I don't believe the intent of this particular notice of motion, and again, I'm not the author, is to provide the public with access. I'm sure that there are a lot of reasons why the public may want to access information that the municipality discusses in closed session, including if you're an interested purchaser of property, right, and you want to access our, our 
information with respect to our real estate transactions, or if you're, uh, you know, the head of a labor union and you want to know what the negotiating mandate for this particular year is. So those are two examples there. But I don't think that's the intent of this particular notice of motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, let's see, I have Councillor Wall for a second time, but I have Councillor Antosky first. So you go ahead, please, Councillor Antosky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a, a, a comment and a question. The comment first, um, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Heidi had said, you know, the, the Ombuds, uh, ombudsman would want, you know, the best evidence possible. Well, I, I would suspect that we want to have that as well. Um, <clears throat> But my question would be, uh, there was a question raised earlier in terms of, you know, how is all this information kept? How is it secured? Who has access to it? Would it not be the same as our in-camera um, documentation? So through the chair, um, and I, I'm speaking a lot because our clerk, our wonderful clerk is on a well-deserved vacation. So I, I'm going to discuss that. And again, Mr. Gauthier is here to bail me out if I need some more specific <laughs> record detail. But Thank I can you. see that we, we've done some preliminary research and um, municipalities such as Hamilton, London, and Brampton actually have policies around this particular thing. So while they do record their closed meetings, um, they have policies related to the storage use and access to this information for good reason. And, and I, I can say, well, I'm given this opportunity, we recommend that a referral back to staff take place so we can develop some um, additional information and, and sort of a draft policy around that. And those policies in some cases include encryption of the data and, and actually storage on in a special area um, and cost of that storage because um, you're creating a digital record as opposed to our um, you know, paper records that we usually produce within our um, closed meetings and they have to be handled differently. Those policies from what I understand as well also include information about whether or not we would produce those documents in litigation. So anytime you're, once you record, you've created a new record um, and that record could be subject to disclosure through MFIPA, so through an FOI request. And either way, it would have to be considered by your, your records coordinator who's in charge of that disclosure. Um, you also want to consider whether or not statements made by members of council would be subject to you know, absolute or qualified privilege when made in a closed meeting environment, right? So are you protected from defamation suits? If somebody were to sue the municipality, that record would become producible in litigation with some very limited exception. So Production for closed meeting investigation purposes is different than production for litigation purposes, which was alluded to here tonight, um, as well as different for production under the freedom of information um, process. And so I think you would want to turn your mind to all the different instances when that record may be used against you, as opposed to for you in a closed meeting investigation. Thank you, Heidi. And one further question. It, it sounds like, you know, we've looked at a... Um, uh, best practices of, of many different uh, municipalities. Have we looked at who is not doing this in, in, as well? Um, so through the through the chair, um, Mr. Gauthier can speak to that. And I, I want to say we haven't looked at best practices. We did a it wasn't a deep dive, it was a toe in the water. And so um, we just haven't had sufficient opportunity. So we're not, um, frankly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think Mr. Goche with his headset there is even prepared to answer that question. But um, Chris, if you wanna to speak to that a little bit more thoroughly. Sure, through the chair I, uh, to Councillor Antoski, I can say that there are more municipalities that don't have this than those that do. Uh, from the preliminary research that I did, I was only able to find a handful of municipalities, all of which have policies. So really having us do that research, look at best practices to determine what that policy should include, you know, with regards to what's the purpose of the record, who has access to the record, what's the format, how's it stored, how long should it, should it be stored, who has access, and how uh, you, and how that would apply in our FOI process and the resources used to uh, distribute any type of FOI requests. Uh, that's something that staff would certainly uh, take back if this item is referred and to provide that type of information to members of council. Thank you, Councillor. Your clock has run out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I can't support this. There's a, a number of uh, councillors who don't honor the in-camera aspect of things. And uh, it's, it's happened where the in-camera notes have made their way to the expositor within minutes of the in-camera meeting ending. So if there was any way that counselors had access to these recordings, it would just make things that much worse. 
uh, without any kind of a, a policy in place, I certainly can't support this at all. So it's uh, it's unfortunate that uh, some members of council don't honor the in-camera process, but it does happen. And I think this has the potential uh, to make things very worse. And, and Heidi alluded to some of the problems that could be uh, exasperated for the city if we go down this road. So I think it's best to just defeat this now and, and not worry about it. Uh, Councillor, thank you very much. Um, I see some second time speakers, but I'm just gonna jump in and comment before I come back to those folks. Um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a strong feeling about this. Uh, I, I could certainly appreciate the uh, preamble with respect to openness and transparency, uh, but I do, uh, I do hear what uh, staff are saying that um, it's not just about members of council, it's also about our community partners. It's about the people we negotiate with. It's about the people that we transact business with. And most importantly, it's about our staff. And um, on the face of this today, I don't, have, I don't have the confidence that we're headed in the right direction. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, somebody on this committee tonight, I can't do it because I'm in the chair, somebody will hopefully um, um, amend this to get a referral back to staff to get a fulsome report about this so that we can give this um, resolution the attention it deserves um, in an open and transparent fashion. Um, now, let me see, Councillor Vanderstel, sorry, um, Councillor Van Tilburg, we always confuse you. Uh, you go ahead, you have the floor, please. I'm actually supportive of this and the direction it's going. However, um, I would like more information. So absolutely, I would uh, like to move a referral. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Your mood was on. I missed that. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, that was something that was something that I had brought further uh, forward for, uh, earlier in the uh, in the course of this discussion. I intend sorry, to. Dan, I missed that. that. Um, okay, so Councillor Van Tilburg, um, it's it. If you no. wish to move that, you may, or you can defer. No, no, Councillor Councilor Vanderstelt uh, certainly can move that if that was the intent. I, I just uh, must have missed that portion. Okay. If that's your desire, Councillor, I'll go to Councillor Vanderstelt now. Are you are you finished, um, Brian? Uh, Councillor Van Tilburg, rather? As I said, I was supportive of the direction that this is going, but uh, I, think, I think we all kind of want to have something more substantive come to us. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Vanderstelt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I know I indicated that I wanted to listen to the conversation before moving the referral, and I apologize if I've stepped on any toes in the process. Uh, it is my intention uh, to move this referral. Um, you, you can come to back, back to me at a time of your choosing, seeing two more speakers in the queue. I'm happy to let you continue. Everyone that wanted to speak wants to spoke at once. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with your permission, permission to council, I would like to refer this to staff based on the, the unknowns. Uh, there's an unknown cost factor associated with this. There's an unknown best practices and policies uh, issue related with this. Um, the fact that there are more municipalities who do not have a policy and best practices on this than there are that do. Um, there's also a, a very significant portion, I would say, of the content of a communication that would happen in year one that would seem inappropriate in year 10, considering how much our common vernacular changes over time and how much our acceptability changes over time, which I would hope wouldn't have an effect on staff or council members alike. So there's a lot of moving pieces to this piece of proposed legislation, and I certainly would want to make sure that we... Uh, take all of them into account in a staff report, uh, and I'm moving a referral, seeing a seconder in Councillor Utley. Uh, fair enough. Now, um, there is an opportunity to debate a referral, folks. Um, let me just look through my list. Councillor Carpenter, you're a first time speaker, so I'm gonna give you first crash. Sorry, yes, on the referral, you're a first time speaker. Yeah, I'm happy to support the referral. I'd like to get the ball rolling and staff can comment. Uh, I think Heidi made a good presentation about things that needed to be asked and sorted out and policies and procedures. And 
Uh, other big cities are doing this and uh, we, there's no reason why we can't uh, be a big city too and, and act like one. And, uh, and, and th there's a reason for, for recording it. And I think that'd be great that uh, they come back with policies and procedures that protect everyone. And this isn't about whether something is going wrong. This is about a, another way of uh, keeping track of, of how meetings go. And for our records, it's another way of, of, of record keeping. And it's a modern day. We do recordings. It's a modern day. We're doing Zoom meetings here. Uh, the public can be recording these now. So like, it, it, I'm happy to have it referred. And I would hope my colleagues would support the referral. And we simply just have staff come back with a fulsome report about how this can be done. Thank you. Councillor, thank you. And Councillor Wall, you have the floor. All right, forgive me. It's been a while. I want to support this, but I don't agree with the wording. So is it too late to amend the wording of this thing that we're referring or no? Uh, we're, we're on the referral currently, Councillor. So it's um, either support the referral and the wording or not. That, that's that's my ruling that we're only going to debate the referral rather than try to amend yeah, the- Yeah, no, that, that's fair. Yeah. So then this comes back to us with this wording at another time. Councillor, it will come back to us with a staff report and when it does come back to us, um, it's of course open to any sort of amendment that you'd like to put forward and you can find a seconder to support. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Councilor Antosky, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll just be very brief. I, I support the, the uh, referral. I, I think absolutely the intent is, um, you know, to do do it the right way that everybody is protected. So let's find the best way to do this. I think that we do have to go down this road. This is this is our world now. Um, I don't I don't know of any um, strong argument to not do this. We just have to find out how to do it right. So I hope it's supported. Councillor, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Um, I'll just comment then that uh, there is merit to the resolution. That's why I support the referral. Um, as you heard Chris say earlier, there are about 440 communities that aren't doing this and a handful that are. Uh, and it may be something that we choose to do based upon the answers we get back from our professional staff. Uh, let us now go to the vote on this item. Councillor Edley, we're, we're just waiting for your vote. Yeah, to... it's not coming up on my screen. I, I vote in the affirmative. Thank Great, you. Great, thank you. The referral of item 7.4, recording in camera meetings, carries on a mass, carries unanimously on recorded vote of nine to zero. Members of the committee voting favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Slash, Martin, and Toski, Wall, Van Tobor, Carpenter, McCreary, and Atley. Uh, thank you, Chris. And Councillor Carper, it's over to you again for item 7.5. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Acting Mayor, Councillor McCurry. Uh, uh, it's moved by myself and seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Cheryl Antosky, whereas Proctor Avenue was reconstructed a few years ago, and whereas the front of the reconstructed lawns on the homes of Proctor Avenue are full of weeds from the said reconstruction turf, and whereas city-owned cul-de-sac at the northeast corner of Proctor Avenue is full of weeds and rarely cut, and whereas the neighboring residents of the street have been trying to pull out the weeds to beautify the unkept property, and whereas Councilor Carver asked for something to be done to rectify the concerns on April 19th, 2021, and again on April 21st, and whereas Councilor Carver spoke with engineering staff in early June, and whereas the response of overseeing will be done in the fall was given, therefore be resolved that the appropriate staff be directed to meet with the residents of, and the ward council to resolve the concerns regarding the city owned property that fronts their homes. And just speaking to it briefly, this is a, an issue with a cul-de-sac and I have uh, maybe staff to put the map up. So the size of the cul-de-sac and maybe a picture of, uh, of, of its conditions. And it, it got left off the cutting for some reason, but uh, uh, well, that picture is pretty small, but I guess, there you go. Uh, that's, a, that's a city owned property. Uh, and uh, maybe you could give them the, the size of it so they could see the size of it by the map that I sent you. Okay, just, I'll just speak to it then while staff's trying to do that. And th the issue here is that this is a large cul-de-sac and it, uh, you know, what happens is a, uh, the road got reconstructed. What, what ends up happening is then they, uh, 
grass gets put down or the, the, the topsoil. And depending upon when, it, when it's sodded uh, or seed, the weeds that grow in there uh, come to the property and is completely weeded. Uh, when I approached this, the, the area, there was all the neighborhoods that surround that property were on that cul-de-sac from bags of weeds that they're pulling out. Uh, they don't mind, they don't even mind maintaining it, but they'd like to start with something that was re relatively decent. So I just wanted this resolution for the ward counselor, counselor Tosk and I to meet with the staff that's responsible for this cul-de-sac, a city owned property uh, and the residents to decide what we can do with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, counselor. Um, there we go, screen is back. Any other discussion folks? Councilor Martin. Thank you. A question through to staff. Uh, would it make sense to consider whether this area should be paved to uh, avoid weeds in the future? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Martin, uh, we, we can give that consideration to any uh, cul-de-sac. This is an example of one of many we have within the city that obviously uh, require ongoing maintenance. Uh, obviously, hard surfacing it has advantages, but maintaining it also has advantages with regards to gardenscape. So uh, we are of the opinion of, of, of either option would work for us. Obviously, hard surfacing would lower our maintenance costs and uh, our grass cutting and our, and our uh, turf maintenance uh, down the road. So we are, we are uh, approachable for either option. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, well, I guess we'll go to the vote on this. Uh, Chris, if we would, please. I vote in the affirmative. Thank you, Councillor. Item 7.5, Proctor Avenue maintenance carries unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstel, Slash, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Utley, McCurry, Carpenter, and Van Tilborg. Uh, thank you, Chris. So that concludes resolutions if I'm reading my uh my slate of items here correctly. Uh, Councilor Martin, can I ask you to, to read the titles of those two notices of motion? Certainly. 8.1 Driftwood Drive Safety Initiative and 8.2 Morton Ave at Grand Always Stop Control. Councilor, thank you very much for that. And I wanna thank everybody uh, for uh, tuning in tonight and thank you members of the committee for going easy on your chair. Uh, we are now adjourned and uh, we'll see you all next week.